I uh, recently heard a um, story about somebody who said that basically God came to them and apologized to them. And there's kind of um, kind of this idea that um, that God has wronged us or is somehow um, has to explain his actions. Um, kind of like, um, well, I don't think that those things are right that you have done, God, so you have to either give me an account or you have to apologize to me for doing that. And it's very common in our society. And um, I think it's due, due to a lot of things, such as the Bible isn't really believed by a lot of Christians in the modern world anymore, and I think that has something to do with it. Um, but so we're going to look tonight about forgiving God. And I don't want you to think that, you know, I'm... I don't know what the right word is, uh, being PC about this or anything. I just want to look at something that is, I feel like, not often looked at in sermons. So, uh, first off, um, there was a song that Metallica wrote. Um, I want to say it was in 91. Um, I think the guy who wrote it was James, if I'm remembering correctly. I'm not positive about that. But the title of the song was called God Who Felt. Um, and you, you guys who know rock probably know the song. Um, and it was written under the, after some events happened, uh, his mom was actually in a cult um, called uh, Christian Science. And uh, if you know anything about that, it's basically a lot about, you know, the physical world doesn't exist. And, you know, don't go to the doctors because if you have enough faith, you'll just be healed. Um, ironically, the person who founded uh, Christian Science, her name was Mary Baker uh, Eddy. Um, she actually ended up dying of cancer, a very slow and painful death. And um, a lot of the people who have been involved in this cult have actually gotten um, in the same in the same problem too. Um, in fact, more recently, there's been some churches who said something like we're a cancer-free church or something like that. Um, and then, um, no sooner than they say it, one of their leaders or board members or whatever end up getting cancer and dying. Um, see, the, the truth is, is that we live in this in-between reality of we were made on a good earth and everything was made as good. But then, see, we sinned and so then the creation had a curse put on it. And we've been living under this curse. And just because we are saved doesn't mean that we can somehow deny that this curse exists or somehow rebuke it away. Um, obviously, the Holy Spirit does heal. And that's kind of what I want to look at is that fine line there between God can heal but doesn't always heal. My great-grandpa, who is the person who actually started this church, um, I'm not sure when, probably in the 50s. Um, but anyways, when he started this church, uh, he had a series of health problems, and God healed him of all of it except for um, a brain tumor, if I remember correctly. And he actually ended up dying. Now, I find that kind of odd that God would go to the... I don't know, waste of time, I guess, to heal him of all the other stuff and then leave the brain tumor. I'm one of those guys that, you know, thinks more, you know, hey, let's fix the problem. You know, if you're going to fix that, God, why don't you go ahead and fix this? I mean, if I'm getting an oil change, I might as well change the oil, you know, the oil filter, too. I'm already there. You know, why waste my time? But, you know, God doesn't really think like we do. Um, so anyways, uh, the Metallica, when they wrote this song, it was after his mom died, and in the song, you can hear a lot of bitterness that he has towards um, God. Obviously, the, the, the name of the song is called God Who Felt. <laughs> Obviously, there's bitterness there. Um, and he talks about how basically um, Jesus, you know, died at the cross and that he was unable to heal her. Um, and there's obviously the obvious that she wasn't actually standing on scripture. She was standing on false teachings and a cult. So that's obviously needs to be said. But then also there's the, th there's the obvious that God never says that he will heal us every single time that we pray. There's just something about that where does prayer accomplish much? Yes. Does it force God to do everything that we tell him to do? No. And there is that in-between of seeing God do mighty things and yet not seeing God do everything that we want him to do. And uh, 
throughout the process, we kind of get um, sometimes a little bit bitter towards God. Questions like, how could God let it happen? Why doesn't he just do something? Why, you know, he can do it, so why doesn't he do it? And, um, you know, obviously it shouldn't have to be said that, you know, everybody dies. Everybody dies. Um, it, in the end, it really doesn't matter if we go through cancer or through some other means. Getting mad at God because he decided to let us die in one way or another way doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, but I've never died of cancer, so... <laughs> You know, I, I guess my opinion is a little bit limited there. Um, which brings us kind of to an idea. Why should I forgive? If, if you are familiar with uh, television preachers or um, online blogs or, or different things like that, you'll hear people say something along the lines of this. Forgive people so that you release yourself from bitterness. Okay. I think that that is true in part. I think that when we forgive people, it does release us from bitterness. Okay. But still, that's not why we forgive. So then that takes us to another commonly um, said reason. Uh, you forgive someone to release them from the burden. Well, I've seen a lot of people that just don't really care if they're forgiven or not. So I don't really think that that one holds much weight. Um, and not only that, but if you notice, these reasons kind of make it a selfish, and make forgiveness more of a selfish thing. I'm forgiving them so that I'm not held back by them anymore. Well, that, that's kind of being bitter towards them still, which might mean you probably haven't forgiven them in the first place. Um, and if you're forgiving them to release them from some burden, you're probably thinking from an arrogant standpoint, like you're holding them captive by being bitter. And it doesn't really work like that either. Um, so why do we forgive people? Because God forgave us. And we forgive people <laughs> because God told us to. See, because people aren't our creation, we don't have a right to not forgive them. But because we were all created by a creator, then the creator really has the final word on what we should and shouldn't do. The, what we call good and, and evil, that is basically what is according to God's character and what is not according to God's character. If you do something good, you are acting in the way that God is. That's who he is. When you act sinful, you're acting against that character. You're acting against God. Because good and bad aren't just abstract ideas or moral moral relativism. It's something that is set in stone based off of who God is. Yet, if we're completely honest, we usually harbor bitterness against God because he doesn't act how we want him to act. And, of course, we have our own ways of saying this, but the truth still remains that we don't forgive God when something happens. Going back to the example of somebody dying of cancer, someone that we love very dear to us does something or, or, or they, or they get, get cancer or something like that, and we, we, we take it like a personal attack from God. Because, you know, obviously God is able to do something and he has chosen not to. That means, you know, maybe he just hates me or whatever. And we build up in our minds that God has somehow wronged us. Well, what's the first thing we say when we find out that we have some kind of um, debilitating disease? We get mad at God. Well, why? Because it's like he's wronged us. He has somehow cut our years of pleasure short. How dare he? And I'm not meaning to be sarcastic. That's something that genuinely goes through our heads, through our hearts. We have this idea that somehow God owes us a life that's long, that's fair, and that's everything that we want from it. But the reality is actually usually different than that. Usually we are not guaranteed even the end of today. We, are, we don't know how we will die. Peter knew how he would die. <laughs> Um, but, you know, usually God doesn't tell us how we're going to die. And um, so that takes us to the passage for tonight. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, starting in verses 4 through 9. Um, and Moses is talking to the children of Israel. Um, so the nation of Israel, you could say. And uh, this is just before he dies. And this is what he says. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Basically, it will it, let my words always be on your heart, always be on your lips. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. I'm sorry, on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorsteps, doorposts of your house, and on your gates. Have my word around so you you remember it. Now this is the reason why he wants us to have our attention on his word is because that helps us to follow what he told us to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. So he's saying, okay, love me. This is how you do that. So, just kind of gives us the all-inclusive uh, Cliff's notes there before he's going to go on to the next thing. And so there's a few things. Um, the first thing that, the, 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 before we really get going into this, is the idea you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's basically saying, with everything that you have, love the Lord. Do not hold back any of yourself from God. And yet, still there's that idea that somehow God has wronged us and that God owes us something. But the truth is, A, the idea that, we, that God needs us to forgive him is laughable. The idea that we have a right to not forgive God is also laughable. And so I'm going to break down how we can forgive God and how we can get over ourselves. Because really that's what the issue is. We're saying that God has to answer to us. God is somehow equal to us. And when he acts in a way that's disappointing to me, well, he just messed up. And um, so let's look at a few things. First off, God created everything good. He didn't create sin. He created things um, for a reason. And he created them and after he said them, he said very specifically, it is good. But then Adam and Eve, which were the first two people that God ever made in the garden, decided to sin. As a result, the creation was cursed. You see this in a lot of different things. First off, you see it in the relationship between man and, man and the wife. In Genesis, for instance, it says that the two will become one flesh. It says that he created them male and female. There were, one was not over the other one. They were created as equals. Well, what happened between then and when the law was written? Well, it says in chapter 3, because you have done this, now you're going to be at odds with each other. You're going to desire your husband, but he's going to mistreat you. So now there's not going to be that equality anymore. And if you look, my generation is called the social justice generation, or the justice generation, because they're always trying to get everything to be fair and equal and everything, which I'm not making fun of. That's, that's good for them, you know, whatever. But the thing is, is why we feel that burning desire to do such a thing is because in us, I truly believe this with all my heart, there's that, it's like we're missing something. We, we know that we were made for something greater, something better. But yet we've restricted our lives to pleasure, we look at pornography, we spend our money however we want, we waste our days, we spend all of our time instead of at work or instead of with our families, we spend it doing selfish things for ourselves. And we've reduced our lives to just a fragment of the glory that was meant. And then we say, God, why are you letting these bad things happen to me? Why isn't life fair? And the truth is, we're, we're, we're not even getting the idea of what God's doing. We've, we've, here's what God's doing, and we've broken that. And then from that brokenness, which is the curse, we've taken even a smaller part of that and said, how can I give myself as much pleasure as humanly possible before I die? And so surprise, surprise, my generation is looking for something to satisfy themselves and trying to make the world perfect. Well, obviously they're doomed to failure, aren't they? Nothing they do is ever going, first off, it's never going to stick. How are they going to know what's going to come next? And you see what I'm saying? 
So the creation was cursed. But through this, we see that God showed mercy. See, he said on that very day you will die. Did they die on that very day? No. They lived another 900 years. See, and so now we have this problem of death. And if you read ancient literature of the time, all the different religions around Israel tried to give a reason as to why the gods could live on, but people had to die. Why? Most of the time they did it because, you know, hey, humans are insignificant or because of this, that, and the other thing. But Israel said something completely different. They said, we weren't made to die. We now die as part of a curse for sinning against God. So God showed mercy, although it wasn't his fault. Why does God let these things happen? It's not his fault. He gave a clear instruction, do not do this. And then he even went on above and beyond. Instead of just saying, because I told you so, he gave a reason as to why he said don't do this. So it wasn't his fault. Death, sickness, problems, evil, war, none of these things are God's fault. Why does God let them happen? Why did we disobey God? See, God doesn't have to answer to us. We didn't answer to God. And so now we have problems. So then we try and live our lives how we want. And then we say, well, even though I'm hurting other people, it doesn't matter because I'm living how I want. Wasn't well, that exactly what Adam and Eve did? So you're complaining about the effects of people not serving God while you do not serve God. See, that sounds like repeating stupid. If you see somebody do something stupid, don't repeat the behavior. That's exactly what we do. And even when we try to do the right thing, we do the wrong thing. So none of this is God's fault. But there is some good news. This life is not the end. This life is not the end. You know how cruel, unbelievably cruel it would be to, for God to cut our years short with cancer and with other things if there was nothing in the next life? If we just ceased to exist? That would be unbelievably cruel. Why even make me just to cut me short? Why make a child only to kill the child before it's even born? How, what an unbelievably cruel thing to do. But this life is actually just a small fragment of what is to come. Because once again, although we didn't deserve it, God still showed his mercy in giving us a chance of restoration. See, the new, in the end, that'll be the beginning of things being set right. Well, I'm tired of corrupt politicians. Yeah, I am too, but guess what? There's a day coming. says we won't even need a light because of the glory of God. Well, I'm tired of unfair treatment. Yeah, me too. But there's a better day coming. There's a better day coming. Anything we do in this life that is not focused on God and on God's kingdom is a complete waste of time. A complete waste of time. God loves us and he offers hope. You know, God didn't have to do that. He could have just let, our, let us go through our days in misery and then at the end when we die just say, hey, do you want to go to heaven or hell? You could have done anything you wanted. But he chose to give us things in his life that give us pleasure. He chose to. Even though we failed, he still gave us mercy in that. When he cursed the creation, he could have made it unbelievably ugly. Did you see that sunrise this morning? So we see that he eased our burden. So tell me again why God owes us and how we somehow have the right
to not forgive God. See, it's arrogant things like this that keep us from truly knowing God. In essence, we broke our own leg and he healed us. In essence, that's what happened. Think of it, if you want, in terms of a, a, a corporate takeover. God is the CEO of the most powerful company in the world. And our business is a small, crappy business that's bankrupt. And then he bought that small, crappy, bankrupt company, and it never did well. And he still poured his, all of his finances into that company. That's us. He doesn't save us because of some great thing that we have to offer him. And that's the main problem with having this idea that somehow God has wronged us. Because it overlooks the very simple fact that God and us. So God didn't send people did. God made us special and he loves us. It's like a painter who decided that he was going to paint something today, th that day. And so he painted the picture and he said, that's a great picture. I have an idea for another one too. See, God didn't have to make you. He chose to make you because he wanted to make you. That means he wanted you. Because if he didn't want you, he wouldn't have made you. Remember that. There's not a single person that God did not create. Remember that. God is not equal to us. He doesn't have to give us an answer. It's, let's, let's go on, on, a, on, a, on a little, little bit of a off trail here. Let's assume that God is the most evil thing in the world. Let's just assume this, okay, for the sake of argument. God is the most evil thing in the world. He, he hates us. He just wants to destroy us. He still wouldn't owe us a, 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 a reason as to why he acts like he does. Now, knowing that God is good, how much more does God not owe us anything? See, I mean, he doesn't have to explain things to us because God and us. See, my generation's kind of forgotten how insignificant they are because they think the very small things that they do in society are somehow of eternal importance. And although I will say that I'm, I'm really happy that they are finding a way to get involved and to do things, the temporary will always be the temporary and it eventually one day will pass away. This nation that we love will not last for forever. Eventually, everything passes. Everything passes. So God doesn't have to give us an answer as to why he does something a certain way. So sometimes we have this idea, why does he wait to destroy those who hate him? Why, why doesn't he just go ahead and, and destroy his enemy? Well, the same reason he is patient with us. We were God's enemies and he decided not to crush us. See, everybody wants, wants God to act and for God's justice unless it's against us. We're okay with God bringing punishment and judgment on other people. But as soon as we are held to the same measure that we want God to judge other people, all of a sudden we want mercy. See, but God doesn't pick favorites. He loves everyone and he shows mercy to everyone. All those times you did all those stupid things, he showed you mercy, didn't he? And he showed you mercy to, the, to those people that you don't like either. So God isn't involved in clubs or cliques against some. Well, we have our clique and God is on our side and he hates those people over there. So we're going to do things to align ourselves against those people. kind of the idea of somehow it's us versus them. Let's not put ourselves on too high of a platform there. God didn't create us, us versus them. And did you know that in the resurrection there will be both Republicans and Democrats? Ooh, did I say that? Yes, I did. Because our salvation isn't based on our belief in President Trump or President Obama or anyone in between. It's based on our belief in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get so caught up in the rat race around us that we forget what things are really about. And we start hating people simply because of who they voted for, 
what their views are on politics, whether they're communist or socialist or can, what's the other one, the one that we are? Um, capitalist, that's the one. Yeah. And uh, just pointless, pointless, stupid stuff. So just a few things in closing. Uh, first off, we're going to look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Verses 34 through 35. And Paul has gone through this long, really long, uh, whatever you want to call it, discourse or whatever, about basically Israel's place in history and in the future and that kind of stuff. And he goes through this long thing in chapters 9, 10, and 11. But then at the end of chapter 11, he says this, which is actually, um, he kind of quotes some different parts of scripture, but um, we're not really going to look at that. Let's just look specifically at verses 34 through 35. It says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has known how God thinks? Okay. Or who has become his counselor? Who should tell him how he should think or how he should act? Okay. Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? Who does God owe? See, that's, that's the real question. So tonight we're looking at the idea of forgiving God. And I would obviously put the, uh, I feel like what uh, scripture is abundant with. First off, we don't have any reason to forgive God because it's our own fault. But even if there was a reason to forgive God, we don't hold something over God. And assuming all that, we need to forgive him because... You can't love someone that you don't forgive. You know, have you ever been around two people who get in a fight? I'm not going to say have you ever been in a fight, because I'm not going to ask you to incriminate yourself. Um, but, you know, there's this part in a fight. You know, at the, at the first, they're both focused. They see you, you, see, you know, they, they know what's going down. But then after a, punch, a couple of punches, First off, it's not like in the movies where you just take like five punches in the face and you're, you know, I'm good. No, you take about one, maybe two, and you're out. Well, let's just assume that you make it past that first punch. You're so turned around, you just, you just swing wild. You know what I mean? You don't really even know what you're swinging at. You're just like, Ugh. You know, that's, that's what happens when we are in pain. We start swinging wild. And so... Don't, don't attack the doctor who's healing you. See what I mean? Like, we have a broken leg, and he's trying to fix our broken leg, and so then we take it out on him because we're in pain. You know, I know sometimes life is hard, sometimes it really sucks, but just because we are in pain doesn't mean that we should take that out on God. Because out of everyone involved, we can be sure that God 100% is not the problem. He's, he's that passerby. The two people are getting in a fist fight, and he's just the person standing there. You know, don't, don't blame your problems on God. At the end of the day, there's only a few things that cause our problems. Us, other people's sinful decisions, temptation, or the fact that the creation is cursed. So you, you take that, and, and nowhere in that is there, hey, this is God's fault. People do stupid things, and it has consequences. I mean, you don't have to like it, but that's the way it is. So we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um, so that's really the in closing. You may feel like somehow God owes you something. But, and I mean this in a nice way, get over yourself. Get over the pain. Get over it. I know that's going to be difficult. I know that's going to be difficult. I mean, obviously, if you, a mere mortal, are trying to take your grievance up with God like he owes you something, obviously you have a heart problem. So, um, it, 
It's time to let the past die and move on. I know sometimes things just don't seem real fair. But just let it go because it's not God's fault. Can I have...